subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update. Join the only official Telegram channel of Rao's IA Study Circle to get relevant material and important updates. Hello everyone and welcome to Daily News Simplified, your one-stop solution to detailed analysis of current affairs which are published in the daily edition of Hindu newspaper and are equally relevant for your UPSC preparation. Articles dated 4th of January 2022 are listed on your screen and the timestamping for these articles is already given in the description box. So let us begin with the first article for the day. This article got published on page 1st of Delhi Edition Hindu newspaper and talks about the recent move which was taken by China on Pangong Lake in Ladakh Division or the Union Territory of Ladakh. The context of the article says that China is constructing a bridge in the eastern Ladakh which will connect the north and the south bank of Pangyong Tasho Lake which is situated in the southeast direction of Union Territory of Ladakh. And this will reduce down the time which is taken up by People's Liberation Army that is the Defence Force of China and will help China to move troops in much faster manner between these two points. The relevance of this article from the prelims comes from the fact that it is important for your math work related questions in the prelim examination. As far as means examination is concerned, it is important in order to quote some relevant argument in your GS paper 2 under India's relation with its neighborhood and as a fact of national security in your GS paper 3. The content for today's discussion would include the map work, purpose for the construction of this road, the background of the issue in this lake, rights enjoyed by both the nations as well as the individuals in this lake, issues related to the fingers which are part of the surrounding of this lake and we will also look into some of the elements of Pangyong Lake itself. As far as location of this construction activity is concerned, well, it was constructed between the Kurnak Fort, which is north of this lake, and the Moldo, which is at south bank of this lake. This construction of bridge is about 25 kilometers away from the line of actual control, which we normally call as LAC between India and China. So let's say if this is the entire lake and this is somewhere the LAC, then this construction of bridge is somewhere here which is around 25 kilometers away from the LAC and this is the eastern part which is under Chinese control. The purpose of constructing this bridge is straightforward that it will reduce the overall distance between these two north and south point by 150 kilometers that means it will pace up the movement of People's Liberation Army across these two points and will help in strengthening its position around the lake. Previously, well, Indian Army got a tactical advantage over the Chinese PLA, that too in the southern bank in the August last year. How? Well, India occupied some of the peaks which were lying vacant since 1962, that is the year when both these countries fought a war. And after occupying these peaks, India gained a substantial momentum in Moldo area, which is the southern bank of Pangyong Lake. Even in this northern portion, Indian troops had set up some of the posts, and these posts are the army posts, where Indian Army personnel are stationed permanently in order to keep eye on Chinese movement. And these posts are situated on the positions which are on the ridge lines of finger 4. Now to those students who do not understand this fingers, well we will have a detailed discussion in this article itself. As far as background of this issue is concerned, well line of actual control which came after 1962 war cut through the lake, that is Pangyong Lake, but both the countries do not agree on the exact location of LAC over this lake. In 1999, when India was fighting the Kargil war with Pakistan, during the Operation Vijay, most of the Indian forces were shifted to the western front close to Pakistan. And China 
on its selfish move took the opportunity and advantage of this movement and built a road of about 5 kilometers inside the indian territory along the lake's bank and this is how the issue got aggravated into a frontier dispute and since 1999 there have been a direct clashes between chinese and indian forces as far as administration of this lake is concerned well chinese position physically overlooked india's position in the northern trip of the pangyong lake and from one of these roads as the thing stands a 45 km long western portion of the lake is in india's control and while rest of the lake that is eastern part is under chinese control so it is more like this assume that this is the pengyong lake and in 1999 let's say this was the lac now what china did that they constructed a road around let's say this region and from that period the entire eastern front went to china and entire western front is under india's control and this area since then has remained a matter of dispute Now, when it comes to the rights of this region, well, both the nations have patrolling rights, with their forces being stationed permanently in this area. Tourists, however, are not allowed to visit Pengong Taso Lake until 1999. However, they can visit now, but they require inner line permit from the office of deputy commissioner at Leh. And now comes the issue with fingers. Well, there are eight fingers which are contentious here. now what are fingers well mountain peaks have different projections altogether let's say this is the mountain peak this is your slope number 1 this is your slope number 2 3 and 4 hence forth so all these are termed as fingers of mountains and similarly there are number of fingers which are there in the northern side of pangong lake which are acting as a barrier as well as opportunity for both these nations to claim their area or territorial sovereignty india has maintained that lac passes through finger 8 that is on the easternmost part and this eighth finger is also the military post of china hence india has been logical in this terms in order to claim the area india has been patrolling up to finger 8 however majority of the patrolling remains subjected to only finger 4 china on the other hand says that lac actually passes from finger 2 and it can patrol up to finger 2 beyond finger 8 in the western portion of this area now let us understand this how it has been through right now now as you can see in this map the blue color shaded area is the pangyong lake the yellow shaded portion is what china has claimed and because of this area finger 5 6 7 and 8 remains under chinese control on the other hand finger 1 2 3 and 4 remains under india's control all these are the slopes which are part of mountainous area now india claimed that india has extended its sovereignty till finger 8 and this is where the actual line of control passes on the other hand china says that finger 4 remains the actual lac and this is how the lac should be drawn in this area and that is the reason why this area remains the disputed area between both these country if you go through this map you can see that this is the actual location of pangyong river This is the southeastern part of your Ladakh Union territory. This red line remains the actual line of control between both these nations and these red dots are nothing but the disputed sites in the past. Now we have often seen students and listeners getting emotional about the map of India. Well this is the reality. This area is administered by the Pakistan however claimed by India. this area is administered by india however claimed by pakistan on the other hand we have ladakh which is administered by india but majority of this portion is claimed by china so as a student of upsc 
you have to go through the reality or the current situation and not by the emotions created on social media. So the current reality is that the portion which is at A and B is currently administered by India and this should remain the reality. However, whenever it comes to the depiction or creation of a map during the examination, it is your responsibility as a citizen of India to show those maps which are published by the government. So government in India publishes Gilgit Baltistan as its own region. Hence, you should also create this kind of map in the final examination. So you should not create any map which does not include Gilgit Baltistan as well as the Askai Chin part of Ladakh. Now let us talk about the Pengyong Lake in detail. Well, this is a long, narrow, deep and landlocked lake which is situated in the area of Ladakh Union Territory or part of Ladakh Himalaya. It is 135 km long. So, as you can see from this map itself that it is a very elongated lake. However, the width of this lake is very narrow. It is situated in the southeastern part of Leh. Well, Leh is the administrative city or administrative unit of Ladakh Union Territory. The feature of this lake is that the water of this lake is brackish. That is, in simple language, it is more salty in nature. And during winters, that is the current period, it is suitable for ice skating and other polo sports. However, tourism activity in this area is very restricted due to the dispute. From this map itself, you can see this is a map from Google Earth. We can easily see that the length of this lake is far more than the breadth of this lake or the width of this lake. The area as you can see on this area that is the star shaped mountainous area is actual area which is under dispute. So whenever you go through the Google, you may find different kind of maps depicting different areas under India or Chinese control. So important understanding is required in order to move ahead and understanding of this topic. As this issue has not been resolved by now, the one thing which we can put as a way forward is that India and China should engage more on the diplomatic front and disengage more on the military or strategic front. With this discussion in place, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article got published on page 8 of Delhi edition Hindu newspaper and talks about the recent initiative which was suggested by the government in order to bring the regulatory policy for EdTech. Now EdTech is nothing but the education technology sector. It simply means the e-learning. So what government has suggested is that there is a need for bringing a regulatory framework in order to control the booming education technology sector which has actually benefited the people from the disruptions that were created during the COVID season. But because of certain limitations and negative outlook, the sector requires the hand-holding support from the government and also require the regulatory framework in order to control the irregular activities or illegal practices that goes against the noble job of education in the country. The relevance of this article comes from the fact that it is important for your general studies paper too, especially from the perspective of education sector. The content for this article would include the status of edtech sector in India, issues which are there with the ad tech sector currently and what possibly could be done apart from this policy in order to bring the smooth functioning of this sector that would benefit the entire generations to come. As far as current status is concerned, well, according to the Blum Ventures report, ad tech market was close to 750 million in 2020. However, it is likely to hit up to $4 billion by the next 5 years. So there is a tremendous potential and growth in this sector that will definitely generate the employment for the people. This sector saw that there was a $0.5 billion of fund which were flowing to this sector through foreign direct investment. And as of now, there are 5 education related unicorns in the country. And unicorn here simply means those private firms that has reached 
the total market valuation of $1 billion or beyond this. But despite this growth, there are certain issues which are associated with this sector. So there is a definite necessity of bringing the regulatory framework. Well, according to some reports, mostly by the NGOs, these education technology companies are exploiting the students with loans for fee-based courses. For instance, a company will say that a person require to submit 1 lakh rupee for let's say JEE courses or for let's say NEET related courses. Now this student belongs to let's say middle class family and cannot afford 1 lakh in one go. So what they will do? They will give a 1 lakh rupee loan to this family at a potential high rate of interest and thereby subjecting the student to not leave this course or this coaching center until and unless they repay the entire 1 lakh rupee along with the interest rate. So this is nothing but more like a financial exploitation. As of now, India is having over 4,500 ad tech companies and out of this 10% came just in last two years and they are not being regulated at all in the right manner. Number of large unicorns has created the monopolization in the education sector where the unicorns are buying the small and upcoming education companies which is against the competitive market mechanism in the country. Most of these ad tech are so profit oriented that they cannot reach the poor sections of the society as you have seen through this example. They are also subjecting the students and their families to financial exploitation. They are mostly oriented towards the profit maximization and sales maximization rather than the social cause. They are also spending more on the marketing in their practices rather than the pure service delivery of education and values. They are targeting the urban high income families and completely deleting the rural areas from their approach. And there is also a hurdle between these education providers and the poor people who cannot afford the digital devices or are living in those areas which are away from better internet connectivity. As a result, there is a wide gap between the kind of education which is being provided to rich class and to the poor class. And this is what we normally call as digital education divide. And this trend is booming in India for the last 4-5 years and strengthened to a greater extent during the COVID pandemic. So what should we do? Well, these are some of the suggestions which can be taken up. First of all, we require a dedicated policy and that is why this article was stationed. We also required a regulatory framework in order to define the financial limits, how much fee they can charge, what services they should allow. We should also talk about the anti-monopolistic practices commission. Like we have under GST regime, where a firm cannot charge beyond the tax limits so, similarly, they can also create anti-monopolistic practices commission which can look into these complaints. We require a separate institutional framework to meet or to redress the grievances of the victims. We require more online platforms to meet the grievance redressal of these people. We require more setups and platforms for free educational services. We are already having SWAM MOOC model where government is providing educational services free of cost to the students. And lastly, we should also utilize the role of non-governmental organizations and the civil societies to provide free and accessible educational services to the poor and the needy people. With this discussion in place, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article was published on page 12, that is business page of the Hindu newspaper and talks about India's engagement with Israel as far as free trade agreement is concerned. Well, recently, India and Israel has agreed to resume a long pending negotiations to come at a free trade agreement and this was confirmed by the external affairs ministers and his counterpart in Jerusalem. The relevance of this article comes from the fact that it is important for your general studies paper 2 for international relations 
and once in 2018, UPSC has already asked questions on India-Israel relationship and the arguments which we are going to discuss here are going to help you to further build your framework in the answer writing for means examination in general studies paper 2. And when it comes to the economic development, it is important for your general studies paper 3 as far as external trade is concerned. The content for the discussion will include the history of negotiations for trade between India and Israel, issues related to trade negotiations and other areas for potential diplomatic relationships. The trade relations and negotiations started 14 years ago in 2017 under the Prime Ministership of Manmohan Singh. It was revamped in 2017 under the present Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi. However, it could not be finalized because of these issues. First was that Israel was reluctant to include the agreement on services in trade because in this case, India holds the efficiency at lower cost. And because of this, Israel believed that India would capture its service sector market, especially in the field of IT, medicines and tourism. So, having this appreciation along with that India had long denial towards the strong friendly relationships with Israel because of the age-old Israel-Palestine issue. However, there was a latest effort, as you can see from the article, which was made by both the nations to resume the number of trade negotiations between both these nations. There are areas for which the trade negotiations are compulsory and should be brought into place, which includes the water management, because Israel is one of the nations which has best efficiency in recycling the wastewater and also the dry land or rain-fed agriculture, technology-related goods, especially the nuclear technology and defense goods, in the areas of energy, particularly the renewable resources, healthcare, medical devices, pharmaceutical, IT and aviation. Apart from this, there are numerous other areas where both nations are looking for partnership. Despite this, both nations have not been able to come to a conclusion or a consensus to have a common deal. The other areas with Israel includes the vaccine diplomacy. Well, both of them has recognized the vaccination process in principle. Israel has allowed Indians vaccinated with COVID shield for travel. This will promote both business as well as the tourism. Military relation includes that India is one of the largest buyer of military equipment from Israel, which includes missiles such as Spike, which is an anti-tank missile, and also some other medium to long-range missile systems. On the other hand, Israel is also the second largest supplier of military equipment to India following Russia. That is, it is even ahead of United States of America in the past 10 years. Coming to the economic relationship, well, India is the third largest Asian trade partner of Israel as per 2014 data, while India is the 10th overall trading partner to Israel. The bilateral trade between both the countries stood at $4.5 billion, which exclude the military sales. Because as far as military sales are concerned, it is very high in proportion to the trade which these two countries are sharing. Given this discussion in place, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article was published on page 11th of Delhi edition Hindu newspaper on international front. Recently, world powers, which includes five powers of United Nations Security Council, that is Russia, China, US, UK and France have met and vowed to stop the spread of nuclear weapons. Despite the fact that all these countries have a huge stockpile of nuclear weapons themselves. So it is more like a person who is corrupt, but despite this, he is the chairperson of Anti-Corruption Bureau. Well, jokes apart, these five global nuclear powers have pledged to prevent the atomic weapon spreading and to avoid the nuclear conflict in a rare joint statement ahead of the review of key nuclear treaty 
later this year. It simply means that these countries would come together and recreate that they will work towards stopping the spread of nuclear weapons further. Now, from this article itself, it is important for us, from the perspective of UPSC examination, to read on Non-Proliferation Nuclear Weapon Treaty and India's connection with this treaty in the past five decades. Well, this treaty came into being in 1970 through enforcement and this treaty had an objective to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons and weapon technology among the member countries. It also promotes for the peaceful use of nuclear energy, which also remains one of the most important and contentious issue of this treaty. And it also tried to achieve the nuclear disarmament, which by the way, it has achieved. But complete phase out is yet a far or a distant dream. The treaty establishes a safeguard system to verify the compliance, that is, whether the members who have signed to this treaty are following the objectives or not, through the inspection which are conducted by international atomic energy agencies. As of now, it has 193 member countries which are signatory and it does not include four important nations, India, Pakistan, South Sudan, and Israel. North Korea was once a signatory but it later on gave up the membership. Despite all these efforts, the treaty could not stop in weaponizing the nuclear weapons in the free world. And this was because of the following reasons. The first one being that it has delegitimized the proliferation but done little to delegitimize the nuclear weapons. It simply means that the treaty talks about the further expansion of nuclear weapons, but it does not talk about the existing stockpile of nuclear weapons holded by the current nations. So in 1970s, there were numerous nations, including the P5, and they had thousands of nuclear weapons which were not dismantled. However, these nations were talking about the dismantling or stopping the further expansion of nuclear weapon technology to the other countries. But nations like India and Pakistan had different plans because of the hostile neighborhoods they had, more specifically the India, which has very hostile neighborhood in both the fronts. Secondly, the top members of this treaty were the permanent members of United Nations Security Council. Hence, leave a very small space for other countries to say or to have better participation. There is no time frame which is given in order to dismantle or disarmament under this treaty. It has been ineffective in preventing the further nuclear proliferation. We have seen the case of India and Pakistan in this regard. It has a stringent IAEA safeguard in order to prevent the non-nuclear weapon state to pursue civil nuclear programs for energy. For example, the case of Iran. As per this treaty, there is a difference and a discrimination between nuclear states and non-nuclear states. And that is one of the reasons why India has remained sidelined or India has remained away from signing or rectification of this treaty. If you go through this map, this map shows the members, non-members and the signatories to this treaty. Well, there are only four nations which include Israel, South Sudan, India and Pakistan which are non-signatory to this treaty. North Korea signed this treaty, however, withdraw later on. So when this treaty could not bring better results, member countries to the United Nations met in 2017 and came up with a new framework altogether, which was known as a treaty on prohibition of nuclear weapon. It simply means that these nations now started talking about utilization of future or even the existing nuclear weapons anywhere by any country. It was adapted by the United Nations General Assembly in 2017 and it is 
the first legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons and lead towards their complete elimination. So if India tomorrow signs this treaty, India will not be allowed to use nuclear weapons for peaceful, non-peaceful research or even for basic testing method. And whatever stockpile India is having, India has to eliminate that. And not only India, even many of the existing powerful nations like China, US, UK or whatever the other countries which are having the nuclear weapons. And that is the reason why these countries have not been promising towards signing or even considering this treaty into reality. Because this treaty stops or prohibits from developing, testing, producing, manufacturing, acquiring, possessing or even stockpiling of nuclear weapons. And that is the reason why this has remained out of the reach of nuclear power countries as of now. Well, as far as India is concerned, India believes that NPT is of discriminatory nature between the nations which are having nuclear weapons and which are not. So it is mostly like have and have not discrimination. However, as per India's nuclear theory and India's nuclear policy, India has said and talked about no first use policy of nuclear weapons. Secondly, India has also voluntarily signed the agreement with IAEA to provide the confidence to the international community that India will not use nuclear weapons as a mode in war or as a mode to put the other nations at danger. But only at first instance. And with this agreement, India has also allowed the IAEA for inspection and accessing India's nuclear material and technologies in order to assure that India is not utilizing these nuclear material for creating weapons of mass destruction. With this discussion in place, now I will leave you with this practice question. So read this question carefully and comment in the comment box. Let us now move to the next article for the day. This article was published on page 12 that is business page of the Hindu newspaper and talks about RBI's move to provide small and online e-payment services. Now from e-payment it is easily be deducible that it will be made on the digital platform. However, offline here simply means that without internet. Because India has larger number of population which could not access the internet mostly being the people from 50 and beyond years of age. Secondly, there are numerous people in the country who do not use the smartphones or could not access the digital payment systems like e-wallets, UPI and others. So, in order to facilitate the digital payment from these people, RBI has created a framework for facilitating the small value digital payments in offline mode in order to promote the digital payments in semi-urban as well as the rural areas. Currently, India is utilizing the UPI or Unified Payment Interface. But this requires a better internet connectivity as well as the accessibility of smartphones. Even in 2016, NPCI that is National Payment Corporation of India Limited launched the National Unified USSD platform which allowed the banking related transactions on feature phones that is non smartphones and that too without the internet however this was not very much appreciated and adopted by the people of rural area previously in august 2022 rbi has already announced a scheme to conduct the pilot test of innovative technology and allow the retail digital payment that is payment made by every possible citizens in retail format in those cases where internet connectivity was either low or was not even at all available. So given, given this background, now they have started a framework for carrying out the retail digital payments in offline mode. This new framework would work like e-rupee, that is digital rupee. It will also function on near field communication payments, interactive voice response based payment systems and others. However, it will not work on digital wallets in online mode. So a person might have some money in digital format, but 
it will require him or her to use these kind of services in order to make a payment. So highlights of this payment say is that the payment will be made in offline mode or could be made in offline mode also. It will use channels like cards, wallets, mobile devices and others. As I said, wallets could be used but in this it will be provided in offline mode. The payments could only be made in face to face framework. Now let us understand this in clear terms. Let's say a person A is situated in city like Delhi and he wants to make a payment to Mr. B who is situated let's say in Mumbai. Now as both of these people are not sitting or not associated in face to face or proximity manner such kind of offline platform will not be available to them irrespective of the cards, wallets or devices they are using. So both of these people require proximity. Let's say Mr. A is a seller and Mr. B is a consumer. So they require a close proximity in order to make an offline payment because here confirmation remains the crucial point. So confirmation in offline payment is important hence their proximity is also important. As this is an offline mode, it will function without the OTP. Exact functioning and the process is yet to be defined. The transaction will include 200 per transaction and at maximum 2000 rupees limit and the balance replenishment can only occur in online mode. Let's say a person has 2000 rupees in his bank account and made a payment to a particular seller in the market in 10 easy installments that is 200 each now as 2000 rupees has been debited from his account he cannot recharge or he cannot put back the 2000 rupees in offline mode so he has to go through online format in order to replenish or refill his bank account money so these are the basic suggestions which were given by the rbi as of now when and how this entire framework will be implemented only time will tell but as of now, if this program come into reality, this will bring a greater push to digital payments in rural India. With this discussion place, now I will leave you with question of the day. The yesterday's question's answer was option D. That is, a pregnancy may be terminated till 24 week was not part of 1971 act and termination is permitted at any time in case of accidental or unwanted pregnancy is not part of this act. So the answer to this question was option D. On the right side, we have question for the day for today. So read this question carefully and answer in the comment box. That's all for today's daily news simplified. Thank you.